How hard is it to take mainland China? What would really matter in such a war? Our video from last week already covered the warfare part of it. The units, numbers, geography and strategy. Do check it out, the link is given below this video. But wars are usually more about politics. In the long term, putting strain on the economy and cutting off some resources to China would also impact its fighting ability over the course of years. That approach is a bit too far into the future for this analysis and the short-term results might be limited against China, as our previous videos on the new Cold War against China showed. Our links to those are below this video as well. In a nutshell, it might take decades of softening the Chinese economy so its industrial capacity and its military are sufficiently behind the US. Such an anti-economic campaign might or might not also produce internal instability, which may hinder China's defensive capabilities. Realistically, the US wouldn't even want to risk a land war on the Chinese mainland, nor would it need to risk it. But still, let us see what political support would be needed for a quick war against China that has a goal of actually putting US troops on mainland China, modeling a late 2020 start of the war. There are two main routes to Chinese cities via land or via the sea. The land ones are in theory a better option. The US could amass as much force as it can, perhaps with the aid of some allies, and simply push inside China. No costly sea invasions that would make the battles of Normandy or Okinawa look like a walk in the park. But in practice, to have a land route, one first needs to have countries that would realistically permit housing such an invasion force. We are talking millions of troops, literally World War II troop number levels. And it's not just about current sympathies. Said countries around China would also weigh what can they gain and what can they lose by actively participating in a war against China in such a fashion. For example, Vietnam doesn't have good foreign relations with China, but it's a fairly small country. Does it really want to risk it? Even if the US does win during the years or a decade to come, would that leave Vietnam a barren land from all the fighting? Indeed, strategically speaking, it would be wise for China to strike first at any US buildup in the neighborhood, before the US gathers most of its forces. Such buildups took months even for far smaller forces, like in the Gulf War 30 years ago. The rest of the Southeast Asian countries, like Myanmar, are more aligned with China compared to Vietnam. India is pro-US and is a potential big ally in itself, but the Himalayas are next to impenetrable. Do check out our video on China vs India for more on that. Plus, it would all likely lead to an even broader conflict, possibly including Pakistan. The US already has some forces in Afghanistan, which has a tiny border with China. But finding enough infrastructure to house millions of US troops in Afghanistan, supplying them via very likely uncooperative if not hostile Iran and Pakistan would be impossible. And even there, the terrain is extremely harsh. Russia is an obvious no-go, being one of China's biggest allies lately, which leaves just South Korea. The US relationship with South Korea is much better than with Vietnam, but the mutual defense treaty the two have is defensive only. So if the US would ask to come in, in huge numbers, to attack first North Korea and then later China through North Korea, the South Korean reply would very likely be quite negative. Risking a war not just with North Korea but with whole of China? And for what? If South Korea says yes to the US, it would be devastated in the war on a World War II devastation scale. It's just too close to China. It doesn't even matter if the US wins or loses, the potential reward from the US after the war would not even nearly cover the damages. If South Korea says no to the US, it will remain intact, as it's not in China's interest to have another enemy in a war so close to it. The US would be furious, of course. There might be various sanctions and economic repercussions. But those are administration policies. And those come and go. If the US wins the war after two or so administration changes in the US, the private sector will likely see more interest in working with South Korea. And trading would continue. South Korea would lose some GDP over those years, but it would be a fraction of the losses it would otherwise incur in a devastating war with China. And if somehow China wins, or even manages a draw, South Korea would be looked at favorably by China, as it stood up to the US. Future US protection promise, after a hypothetical draw with China, would be of little value. 
the well-being of South Korean economy and lives of their people might be better served by remaining neutral, even if that means preventing reinforcements to the already present US troops in Korea. An attack through South Korea would also raise the chances of a world war as well. North Korea only needs to invite both China and Russia to put their forces in the north as a defensive deterrent and the US may have no choice but to go through Russian forces as well to get to China. So realistically the US might have to stick to air and sea routes via the East China Sea and perhaps the South China Sea. But to perform any sort of successful troop landing and to keep those troops supplied one has to have near perfect control of the nearby sea lanes and airspace. It's important to note that the whole East and South China Sea area would be China's backyard. Basically every piece of military hardware and every soldier China has would be available, while the number of the US forces near the Chinese shores would be very variable, possibly just half of the size of the US Marine Corps, but also possibly a magnitude bigger, dependent not just on overseas allies like Japan, but also on the sheer distance from various key bases and the issue of US access to other countries' territory for basing their hardware there would be crucial. That in turn completely depends on the geopolitics. In the best case scenario for the US, it would have full support of Japan, giving them whatever bases they need, giving them access to various commercial airports, etc. Basically having the whole of Japan fighting a total war against China. Would Japan say yes to the US? Most probably. It's protected by the sea and the distance. It knows China can't bring much devastation to it. The occasional bombings and missile strikes would be negligible damage compared to what South Korea might suffer. And there's more bad blood between China and Japan due to all the World War II atrocities and antagonism. There's also the issue of Taiwan. While Taiwan is small enough and close enough to China to be seriously devastated in a war, Taiwan might see it worth letting the US use its bases. China is very clear in its stance that it will not let Taiwan become independent. So Taiwan might seize the opportunity and use the broader war to also gang up on China, knowing in such a war the US would definitely hold its back if it invites US troops on its soil. True independence might even be worth the devastation after the war. Perhaps even the British, Australia and or even India would pressure China from various sides or at the very least provide bases those countries would not see much of a downside to a war, except for a loss of trade. And US political pressure to go to war alongside it might be very firm. Australian bases would come in very handy to the US, for its ships and planes. And with both Japan and Australia on board, the US could have enough bases to bring in pretty much all of its military assets fairly close to China. Furthermore, China might be facing hundreds of additional combat aircraft, SAM systems and ships. All those countries together do have quite a bit of hardware available. Of course, such a coalition would both be hard to assemble and might trigger various other developments, possibly even widening the war to Russia and sparking a world war. There is too many variables involved, so that option won't really be explored. What will be explored, however, is if the US does get to base its military in Australia and Japan, even if the two countries themselves don't actively go after China with their own military. Instead of sending ships back and forth from the US west coast, many ships could be operating from Australia, shaving a third of the distance. Sure, some ships would be based in Hawaii and perhaps even closer in Guam and Japan, but the proximity of bases to China also means greater risk to those ports and bases. Australia and possibly northern Japan might be just the sweet spot for the US bases. Going through Indonesia would shave the distance even more, but that's yet another political actor that would have to be persuaded to allow passage and confront China. Why are close ports important? Because ships and subs, while they can deploy for even half a year, do need downtime. After a deployment, they need to go to a port and undergo maintenance. The crew needs rest as well. And that's providing they don't see much fighting. Just defending against one attack, some ships might expend most of their missiles. Replenishing missiles at sea is an activity that the US Navy has purposefully foregoed. The only remaining option is to go to a port to restock with such big specialized items. Guam might be devastated in attacks, so other ports might be needed. Sailing across the Pacific back and forth takes time, 
possibly 12 versus 24 days in transit, even at constant 20 knot cruising speed. That may be the difference between having 30 or a few dozen more stocked US ships near China, considering the fact ships do exhaust their missiles often and need to restock. Flyovers over countries such as the Philippines and North Korea might be unavoidable, which would increase the risk of antagonizing them and pulling them into the conflict. Antagonizing North Korea on purpose might even be beneficial to the US, if that would somehow result in North Korea threatening South Korea as well, as the US might gain the full support of South Korea even against China. Needless to say, China would not want North Korea to go to war with anyone, unless the US is already attacking the North through South Korea. The Philippines are an interesting factor. The US went to war with them at one point. They were taken by the Japanese in World War II. Afterward, the Philippines proclaimed independence from the US. But the relations have been good since, for decades. There was and still is a defense treaty with the US. But since 2016, the political administration in the Philippines has changed, and relations with the US soured while well, relations with China became much better than they were. It wouldn't be in China's interest to attack the Philippines due to defense treaty the US has in place. But it may not be in the Filipino interest to invite US forces either. Since there aren't any US bases on the Philippines anymore, staying neutral may be easier than it would be for South Korea, for example. The key to the US strategy might be to amass forces in Japan and any other nearby country without attacking China. China would have the choice of striking preemptively, while there are only smaller US forces present, but in doing so, China might be labeled the attacker in the eyes of the world. And that might open the door to a broader coalition of countries against China, mentioned earlier. On the other hand, if China waits for the US to amass all of its forces and then waits to be attacked by the US, that might result in less support for the US, but given that the US would have already practically moved all of its military might, that might not be a better option. The forces China would then be facing would be just as threatening. If the US starts to amass forces in Taiwan on its invitation, China might be furious and might try to attack Taiwan first, while the US is still only in the starting phases of reinforcing it. But such attacks would only turn much of the world against China and have China fight against yet another enemy at the same time, with little prospect of being able to take and hold onto Taiwan in the long term. If Chinese troops do start landing on Taiwan, the actual fall of Taiwan would take months, even without US involvement. And with China exposing itself over Taiwan, a takeover which can be sustained may never properly happen. Strategically, the Chinese would be damned if they do and damned if they don't attack first. In the long run, the best chance for inflicting the most hurt on the US forces would be to play defensively, when it comes to third-party territories, and to try to get as many countries on its side. Russia is a likely candidate, but then we're really talking about a world war. And Russia might very well pull most of Europe into the war as various NATO countries feel the need to react. Pakistan is a long-time Chinese ally, but is too far away to make a difference, except for keeping India in check. Various Middle Eastern countries have been chummy with both the US and China, selling fuel to China and buying Chinese arms and technology, for example, but they would have little to gain by taking sides. The likes of Myanmar, Laos or even Thailand would be of little help to China, as they're just small players, and also have little to gain by joining any side. It's apparent China would not have many allies at all, while the US, depending on Chinese actions and US own coercive policies, perhaps being too aggressive, might have some more allies or many more allies. And all those allies would be absolutely key. With zero allies, the US would not even be able to bring war to China. Without Japanese bases, the US would be forced to carry on the Cold War and economic pressure on China as it would have only a fraction of its forces present near China, where they would be seriously outnumbered. With Japan and perhaps a few more countries on board, the US could do quite a lot, as our last week's video showed. Even with just Japan, the outcome is likely a Chinese defeat, though with more US casualties than if there were other allies present as well. Interestingly, when talking about a coalition against China, its composition would likely change depending on the initial course of the war. If the US is not doing that well, the chance of other countries joining it would drop, 
If the US is doing well, say it managed to pretty much decimate the Chinese Air Force and Navy, then even countries such as the Philippines or Vietnam, which are geographically very well placed, might be somehow persuaded or even coerced into an alliance. So, in a way it doesn't really matter how many troops or planes and ships each side has. Sure, for actual defense on mainland China, Chinese numbers would matter and would prevent the US from actually taking Chinese land. But when it comes to containing China, when it comes to destroying the Chinese Navy and Air Force and laying waste to Chinese industry near the coastline, all those allies would be absolutely crucial. The more, the better for the US. And remember, Binkov may talk about hypothetical wars, but only real peace can bring us all together.